So uh, I think it's important, since I'm going to be talk about, talking about treatment development, that I provide my disclosures. And I highlight in red um, three uh, companies that sponsor trials that I'll talk about. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that I was the lead investigator in any one of those studies. These are multi-site uh, studies. I can comment um, on the Novartis and Roche uh, studies uh, briefly, and we'll uh, detail the Seaside study a little bit more. Um, and then uh, when that happens, it'll come up in red again that uh, I have a disclosure for research funding there. Um, and then the, the second piece is that um, this isn't going to be a sort of data talk where I'm uh, discussing mostly my own research in my lab that I did with my hands. We will talk about stuff that happened in my lab or in my research group, um, but it's really much more of a, a think and broad perspectives talk. And so I'll try to highlight people who are involved, um, but this is to indicate that this isn't just uh, work done by one person or one, one group. Um, so this is uh, what I'm going to uh, walk through today. Um, I'm going to first talk sort of conceptually about uh, some of the ways that I think about autism, uh, talk about current treatments really as a framework for talking about how we get to new treatments, um, and then talk about sort of end goals. Um, and this uh, begins with the challenge that is pretty fundamental in the tension between calling these autism spectrum disorders and the new DSM criterion, which is autism or description, which is autism spectrum disorder, um, as if this is a singular entity. And frankly, it isn't. We all know this. Um, you very rarely get a child who walks into clinic, in fact, I've never had this experience, who only meets criteria for autism and doesn't have any other difficulties uh, in their life or in their family's life. Uh, what you see instead is kids that have uh, clusters of other things going on, um, and those things can include intellectual disability and language impairment, which sometimes is the primary problem, and the autism um, is an additional problem. Um, you can see behavioral uh, co-occurring symptoms. You can see medical comorbidities that are more common. We have any number of research biomarkers, and I, I'm very hopeful about these, but these are not yet clinically relevant um, for the most part. Obviously, you send an EEG when somebody uh, has in, an indication they might have seizures, but we don't send EEGs in every child. And then we have genetic findings increasingly that children either walk in with um, or get along the way, and we really haven't figured out yet how to integrate most of those into treatment. So a child may walk in with this pattern, and this could describe a child with fragile X syndrome, and I'm going to use that as one of the examples, which is always a little challenging when Rondi Hagerman's in the room. So I'll thank Rondi to just cover her ears during that portion of the talk, or to be gracious and come up and give it for me. Um, and, then, and then you might see this child, and I'm also going to use um, a particular mouse model that uh, shows elevated blood serotonin levels. Um, and we have some data showing that uh, blood serotonin levels uh, correlate with uh, some GI symptoms that uh, appear to correspond to constipation plus. Um, and then you have 100 other kids. And you put them in a treatment study, and you come out with results, and you say, treatment X works in autism. Um, that really isn't, I think, the way things are going to pan out. Um, and if you look at the groups, it very rarely is the case that treatment works for every child. This is a fundamental challenge, one of the things that we have to deal with. When you think about things just on a genetic basis, and that's sort of where I got started, we still have a model, and the data fit the model, that we have any number of common genes. You can't show 100 common gene variants interacting on a slide, but common gene variants and environmental risk factors that likely intersect contributing each a fairly minor component of risk, but together contributing to a risk that becomes uh, realized in an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. We have very little data for those individual factors, at least replicated data. Um, what we have instead, and this is true both in genetics and in, on the environmental side, is a number of rare conditions that by themselves contribute in a dramatic way. The most common of these is fragile X syndrome. Um, but then we have a number of others that actually were not identified primarily as syndromes based on uh, observable symptoms that differed from the general population of kids with autism spectrum disorder, but instead were identified on the basis of genetic testing. And some of these are more common than others, um, but all of them are roughly less than 1% of the overall population. When you put all of those together, um, you end up getting uh, a number that looks a bit better, maybe up to 20% of individuals with autism spectrum disorder have something that can be identified using the most advanced research uh, genetic testing. 
what we hope for is as these continue to emerge, that you see uh, common pathways. And I should note that it's important to also think about environmental factors in this class, and there are some rare environmental factors that fit. Um, you want these to cluster into pathways, and there is some indication of that. I'm not going to have time to talk a lot about the mTOR pathway, but there are a number of rare genetic syndromes that do implicate that pathway, and theoretically, you may have common treatments that then uh, may uh, serve to improve the lives of individuals across multiple uh, of these syndromes. But by and large, what we have is individual syndromes that don't easily tie together yet. And then when we think about how that risk moves forward, um, we, of course, don't just have uh, genes down here on the bottom and then behavior up here at the top, and the gene just pop results in behavior. And so what we have instead is a whole cascade that we imagine realizes the risk that's present, um, whether we're thinking about gene or environmental risk factors. Um, from a genetic perspective, you think about genes, proteins, networks, and then it's important, sometimes we leave this out, um, but we're dealing with developmental disorders. You then have the time window in which the risk may be realized. Um, and that's a very difficult thing when you're thinking about treatment studies. You may have the perfect thing, but you may not have the perfect time point. Um, and then, of course, cells, synapses, brain regions, brain circuits, behavioral domains, um, and all of these are very complex to tie together. So if you have one particular risk factor, you might have something, and obviously it doesn't really work this way with linear arrows, but something where it contributes to risk in this way, something else that contributes to risk in a different way, something else a third way, and now from the genetic data, you'd say there may be as many as 1,000 risk genes, and if there's 1,000 risk genes, you can only imagine how complex this sort of a picture would work. Um, but then what we hope for is that you see areas of convergence. We don't, by and large, know what these are yet. Um, they could be at the circuit level, and you could see um, that you see uh, a number of things, say, that uh, run through or, uh, or alter a particular circuit, and that could be a target for treatment. Um, when we don't know the genes, what we oftentimes have is a black box under brain and then some circuits that can be identified by fMRI or on the basis of data in the uh, typical population or based on lesion studies. Um, but then you also may have a protein network that's implicated, and there's a lot of data pointing to individual protein networks, and maybe there too you could have convergence, but not necessarily know the paths that lead from the protein network onward. Um, and then developmental time points and so forth. Um, by and large, from the uh, genetic literature, we get something that's a black box sort of in the middle that we are able to identify genes and then the corresponding proteins. And maybe you can say at what point in development those, uh, those are expressed. Um, but these black boxes exist no matter where you start. Um, there's something that we don't know, and that's what we need to fill in, although maybe we could identify treatments even in the presence of a black box. So that's another challenge. And then, because we just are really complex organisms. And then the genetic data in particular uh, raise a, yet another challenge, which is that you can get risk on either side of a genomic uh, variant. So uh, one of the early examples of this was identified by Huda Zogby's lab, where they found that uh, in mice initially and then in humans, if you had too many copies of the gene that causes Rett syndrome when you have disruption, you actually end up with, with neurodevelopmental impairment as well. Um, and then it's been identified over and over again. Uh, and there are usually differences. Um, so it isn't that you end up with exactly the same thing, but you end up with neurodevelopmental problems regardless. Um, and sometimes autism on both sides of that, uh, that risk, which is really a challenge when we think about applying treatments, right? So um, one example of this is Mark Baer's lab published a really nice paper looking at a model of tuberous sclerosis complex and a model of fragile X syndrome. Both have a dramatically increased risk of autism, but you can correct both the, some of the brain deficits and the behavioral deficits, some of them, by crossing the two lines of mice. So that if you have both problems, you look better than if you have just one, suggesting that they're at opposite poles and a treatment that would push one this way would actually make the other worse. So pretty fundamental challenge, and when you layer that on top of complexity, you may get something that looks more like this, where you're operating on different sides of a circle, but you may still have convergence. We shouldn't expect that convergence to occur in the majority of kids with autism spectrum disorder. We don't live in a world um, where we're going to find a single biologically-based treatment um, that's based on autism risk that is going to help the majority of kids. 
I don't think. I wish that we did. I very much started in, in this arena hoping that we would find such things. I don't think it's likely. I hope we manage things that um, help significant subsets. So that's sort of the bad news. Um, the, the good news of that is that there's another model, and this model has um, been widely panned, but actually is now the basis of uh, an NIH funding mechanism. Um, so this is a problem that's been defined by the FDA as pseudospecificity, which they define as a treatment that is applied um, in a particular disorder um, that has a you know, set of diagnostic criteria, um, but it, that actually isn't specific to that. So to make this real, this would be treatment of anxiety in autism spectrum disorder, or this would be treatment of irritability and agitation in autism spectrum disorder, without any indication that what you're using to treat is really specific to the disorder, um, but it may still benefit people. Um, this is actually the basis of the NIMH research domain criteria, um, with the idea being that if we can understand circuits that underlie circuits, genes, and so forth, that whole cascade, um, that underlie core behavioral uh, issues, so anxiety would be an example of that, sociability might be an example of that, that we may have the capacity to move behavior in the general population, um, and that could be applied within disorders. So um, to make this uh, specific to autism, I, I would answer this question with a resounding yes, but, um, but it's a difficult one. I think we're all looking for things that you would describe as quote unquote cures. Um, these are not things you would describe as cures. These are things that you would describe as pushing on a particular domain of difficulty. Um, we've got a lot of examples of this from something as concrete as constipation. You know, when I first see a child with autism spectrum disorder, oftentimes the first thing I can do to make their lives better um, is to treat their constipation successfully. Really concrete, straightforward, do we think that this is constipation from autism? Not really. Do we understand the path pathophysiology? Not really. Can we treat it? You bet. Um, then you go on to things like epilepsy, which seem more clearly related to autism spectrum disorder, but certainly aren't seen in the majority of kids. You make a child's life much, much better if you treat their epilepsy. And then you have any number of um, what we think of as co-occurring behavioral symptoms that are seen in a lot of kids with autism spectrum disorder are not necessarily specific to ASD. We don't understand exactly why they happen more frequently in ASD but we can treat those individual difficulties um, to some extent currently, but we could certainly develop better treatments that might make lives much better um, by treating these domains. And then you have other things that feel like they're core to autism spectrum disorder, and one of these I would say is sociability. So um, if we define sociability as interest in social stimuli, some people with autism spectrum disorder are not at all interested in social stimuli. They don't want to be around people. Some people are avoidant. Um, and some people are really interested in people but have difficulty negotiating the interaction. So if we had a treatment, a medication, that would increase sociability for a subset of the population, that would be terrific. For another subset of the population, that might actually make things worse. They might become more socially intrusive and that might be interfering. Um, so these are all things that you wouldn't describe as specific to pathophysiology but that would significantly improve lives. And there's a flip side of this. So I would say um, the flip side is that when we approach things um, in this quote unquote non-specific or pseudo-specific way, we're, I think, unlikely to find treatments that move across symptom domains that are truly transformative, um, although you can imagine that they might become cascading. Sociability would be an example of that. If you improve sociability, maybe you see a cascade of operant social learning. That would be incredibly powerful. Um, but these are not things that I would think of as a straightforward, you take a pill, you no longer have whatever it is that um, leads to your autism spectrum disorder. So it's a little background, very brief review of current treatments, and I'm not going to come anywhere close to doing current treatments justice. This is a quick overview. This is in the context of the Vanderbilt Evidence-Based Practice Center um, and a, a review that was funded by ARC. Um, I want to be clear that strength of evidence does not equal degree of benefit. Um, strength of evidence just means how good the research is. It doesn't mean how powerful the response is. Um, behavioral interventions I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, I, not because I want to downplay them, but because I think of things um, from a biological perspective, work with mouse models um, and so forth. Suffice it to say that we have good evidence that early 
and intensive behavioral interventions make a significant impact for many children with autism spectrum disorder. Very important, this is something that we should be doing. We don't necessarily understand yet who responds the most, um, but clearly important. We have um, what you describe as moderate evidence also for cognitive behavioral interventions for anxiety symptoms and higher functioning kids, um, particularly in the late childhood, early adolescent time period. And then we have some, quite a lot of evidence, but mixed evidence that's a little hard to pull together on social skills training. That's all I'm gonna say about behavioral treatment, although I'd be happy to talk about it during the question and answer session. It's a lot of what I talk about clinically. Um, on the medication side, um, we actually have um, more studies, more evidence, which seems surprising since you wouldn't say that most children with ASD currently should be prescribed a medicine. Um, but this comes out of excitement around things that might be transformative. So do people know what the best studied medicine is in ASD? That's what people usually say, risperidone. Um, it's not, actually. Um, it's secretin. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and this is, you know, this is something that we have to remind ourselves of because over and over again, we have things that, that look like they might be transformative. And I, I want you then to think when I'm, you know, presenting hopeful data, to think of it with that in mind. We don't know until we do the definitive studies. And there were actually many definitive studies of secretin showing that it leads to absolutely no benefit. Um, they also showed that there's a very powerful placebo effect in these sorts of studies, which is important. Um, those medicines that people think about when they think about what's been studied and what leads to benefit are risperidone and aripiprazole um, for the most part. And there are ongoing uh, studies or one ongoing study of a sort of copycat medicine. Um, these address irritability and agitation. They're what you would describe as pseudospecific. Most children with ASD should not be taking these medicines, but they are very helpful for some kids. They come with a lot of side effects. Um, we would love to have alternatives that are specific or more specific um, and lead to fewer side effects. Then when we think about all other medicines, we don't have anything else that really crosses the threshold beyond low strength of evidence. Um, the low strength of evidence actually is for ADHD symptoms in the context of autism spectrum disorder. Um, previous to DSM-5, we couldn't say that kids with ASD had ADHD, but that's essentially what we're talking about. And then for the most part, we're talking about treating that the same way, but with less benefit and more side effects. Um, and then there's mixed evidence for serotonin reuptake inhibitors that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, but I'll come back to later in the talk. Um, so that's sort of where we are. Um, and I think that there are a number of paths forward. I'm gonna use a couple of examples because it's easier to use um, sort of deep uh, looks or deeper looks at uh, examples than to be comprehensive. Um, but suffice it to say that there are many other developing stories. One of these is to think from that molecular level um, and to work upward. Um, and here, uh, you think about molecular targets. Um, there are a number of these syndromes, as I outlined on the previous slide. Um, the one that is most advanced, um, you'd say, is Fragile X syndrome. Um, and then after that, you would say probably tuberous sclerosis, where there are ongoing studies right now. Um, so. At the Mind Institute, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time describing Fragile X Syndrome. Um, I'm really gonna try to move fairly quickly, even acknowledging that what I'm doing is a little cartoonish to the treatment studies and some of the challenges there. Um, but to give a brief overview, uh, Fragile X Syndrome is not defined um, by having autism spectrum disorder. Um, what you would think of from a, a, a neurologic perspective um, is the mild to moderate intellectual disability, usually moderate intellectual disability. And then you see, um, depending on where you draw your line, autism or autism spectrum disorder in 30 to maybe 70% of individuals. You see social deficits in a larger group than meet formal criteria. And then you see other behavioral symptoms as well as uh, medical conditions, including seizures. Um, I think it's important to remind people you can't always pick out folks with uh, Fragile X syndrome just by looking at them or doing a physical exam. Um, in fact, I have several features, including the large ears, prominent forehead, and prominent jaw. Um, and so oftentimes when I meet somebody with Fragile X syndrome, they look like they might be a family member. Um, so uh, this is caused by an expanding trinucleotide repeat poly polymorphism in the five prime untranslated region. Uh, when this happens and ex extends beyond 200 repeats, you get uh, gene hypermethylation, silencing, and you lose the corresponding protein FMRP, um, which is an RNA chaperone. This does many, many different things. Um, but one of the things that it's been found to do um, in work from Mark Baer, Kim Huber, um, Steve Warren, and, and any number of others, um, has to do with uh, glutamatergic signaling. 
Um, and this cartoon describes that uh, quite briefly um, in a very simplified way. Um, but if this is the presynaptic neuron releasing glutamate, um, that glutamate is going to hit AMPA and NMDA receptors, but here just showing AMPA receptors, but it's also going to hit G-protein coupled receptors, including MGLUR5. Um, when that happens, uh, FMRP is actually critical for downstream signaling and actually serves as a break on this mechanism. So if you think actually of MGLUR5 as sort of uh, a break on glutamatergic signaling through the AMPA receptor, uh, you would imagine FMRP is more like a release on that breaking mechanism, balancing function at glutamatergic synapses. If you don't have FMRP, what you see then is you see too much internalization of the AMPA receptor, you see an immature appearance, um, and you see extended uh, dendritic spines nearby that aren't suppressed by a mature synapse. So very brief cartoonish description. But that's something that's emerged over the course of almost 20 years since the initial uh, Fragile X model mouse was uh, developed and, and first published. Um, and amazingly, if you look uh, at the brains of these mice, the pathology specimens from humans and the uh, pathology specimens from mice are very, very similar. Um, and the characteristic uh, difference is that dendritic spine change. Um, you do see some changes in behavior. Um, the mice are hyperactive. It's very difficult to show that they have differences in social behavior. It's very difficult to show that they have differences in cognition, which is a good reminder that we don't make mice to figure out what autism might look like in a mouse. We're trying to understand what's happening in the brain. And at least at this level, um, this is something that is a really nice model. So based on that model, uh, Mark Baer's lab then uh, sought to test this using something you can do in a mouse quite easily, genetic engineering, decreasing expression of that MGLUR5 receptor. Um, you can imagine when you cut that in half, you'll decrease uh, the internalization of that AMPA receptor or the removal of the AMPA receptor from the recirculating pool, and you should now see a rescue of the long-term depression phenotype. You should see a rescue of the dendritic spines. Um, and that's precisely what they showed. Um, so this is the wild-type animal. This is the knockout animal. You see more of these spines, and they have a, an immature appearance. And then the, the crossed animal, which actually looks in some ways fairly similar to um, uh, data if you uh, might cross these uh, with tuberous sclerosis mice, the crossed animal actually s shows what looks like a, a normal appearance. And they show improvement in behavior as well and a resolution of the seizures. So you imagine that this might look now something like this. Um, we still do have a black box with regard to, um, to circuitry, um, but you can uh, see that we have a whole lot of knowledge, maybe enough knowledge to lead to treatments. And that's the next step, and this is data from Roche, um, where they looked at a tool compound um, where they're giving uh, treatment um, from shortly after weaning uh, until sexual maturity. In a mouse, that's four weeks. You can imagine translating this into a human study is a little different, right? Um, but when they do that, they see, um, shown differently, but they see a rescue of the dendritic spine uh, phenotype. They see improvements in hyperactivity, quite subtle improvements in learning, um, improvements in sensory sensitivity. So the things that you want to see move are moving. Very exciting data, but then it needs to be translated into a human. So, so that's, that's all the good news, that we know a lot. We no longer have such a big black box. But translating to humans is still quite difficult. And this is evidenced by the reported uh, failures. Um, and the papers haven't been published, but um, the press releases have been issued of adult and adolescent studies uh, by Novartis and Roche testing this hypothesis with uh, drugs that had been sitting on the shelf. They're not as specific as you might hope. And both have more or less shut down those programs. Novartis completely and Roche is sort of discussing. Um, and then the question is, OK, so why does this work in a mouse and not work in a human? And here comes the complexity. So are these just not great drugs for targeting this pathway? Were these the wrong doses? Were the right outcome measures used? These are all unknowns, things that don't translate easily from mice to humans. Was this at the wrong age? So these are adolescents and adults. Um, they were just beginning work on children and not really testing the hypothesis fully in that age group. And of course, we know that these are developmental disorders. And a, an adult mouse might improve um, with a treatment. But what does a mouse really have to do in a cage the size of a shoebox? Not a whole lot. Humans have critical periods for learning things like language. And that's something that we might not expect um, to see benefit in if we're looking at adult treatment. And then, of course, there's the question of uh, do these 
treatments translate across species, and there's data actually specifically uh, with regard to FMRP that there are differences in expression during development between primates and mice um, in areas of the cortex that might be critical for language and other functions. So there may be aspects that just don't translate. Picking the right outcome measures is going to be, be dependent on understanding what really does uh, move across species. There are lots of other targets, um, and Rondi really is the leader in this area, um, so I'm not going to dwell on a lot of these. Um, but I am going to talk about one of them because it's relevant when we move to talking about autism. Um, and that's uh, GABA B agonists. In, in theory, um, this may uh, affect the same synapse by decreasing glutamatergic release. Um, in practice, it's a little more of a black box than that. It does uh, more certainly than that. Um, and you can also imagine other ways to um, dial up response at the synapse. So in thinking about um, GABA-B agonists that have also been um, studied in some of the larger studies, uh, there is uh, data in uh, fruit flies. So it's an unusual thing to imagine that you could translate from fruit, fruit flies to humans. Um, but Steve Warren's group actually found um, that flies that were raised on a high glutamate chow, um, yes, fruit flies have to eat something when they're in the lab. Um, you don't just set out your sandwich. Um, and if they are on a high glutamate chow, they, uh, they die. And you can rescue that by treating them with GABA um, or supplementing with GABA. And you can rescue the rescue. You can cause them to die again by blocking the GABA-B receptor. Um, so something that leads to a particular receptor of interest, but it's not the sort of phenotype that we're thinking about in autism. Um, and then data um, based in part on that from uh, Seaside Therapeutics, looking at our baclofen GABA-B agonist um, in the Fragile X mouse model, showing a rescue of dendritic spines, um, showing some additional rescue, including uh, seizures, uh, marble bearing, uh, potential repetitive behavior, and hyperactivity. It's important to note that in this particular model, it looked like it had the same sort of effects in wild-type animals, um, but it was, quote unquote, normalizing the behavior um, in the mutant animals. And so that may be something that is less specific, but is pushing a system. So these are the initial data um, in, uh, in Fragile X syndrome. And so uh, you can see that there are any number of measures that were close to statistical significance. And in work um, done uh, in large part informed by work from David Hessel here, uh, what they found was an improvements in social avoidance on the aberrant behavior checklist. So this is the sort of thing that you would love to see move. This is a thing that's a problem for many people with Fragile X syndrome, very encouraging work. But really, in an initial exploratory analysis, not something that had a called shot um, and something that was done in a crossover design. So everybody was on uh, drug than placebo or placebo than drug, um, which is difficult um, because sometimes people become unblinded. They know when they're on something that's causing them side effects. Um, and then unfortunately, uh, Seaside Therapeutics carried this forward um, into an adult study, adult and adolescent study, um, and really found no signal. Um, and then cut short a study in children. Um, so we don't know whether it would uh, show benefit in, in children. Um, and then they folded. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the autism side about, of this in a minute. This doesn't sound tremendously hopeful, but this is a place where we actually have insights into things that might work. And there are additional things that are uh, under study now by Rondi and others. Um, where it's connected to the actual molecular change that happens in the brain. Um, and one of these things we can expect is going to lead to benefit, maybe multiple will. And you might expect that where you have a mGluR5 related behavioral problem, um, that you may see a, a response to that. And where you have, say, a dopamine related behavioral problem, you may see a response to something else. Um, and I think you know, over the next five to 10 years, we are going to see emerging treatments. Um, but certainly, I would have told you a more hopeful story two years ago when these studies were still ongoing. So, that's an example of how you go from a risk factor uh, through a, you know, obviously fast forwarded understanding of what's actually happening in the brain, and then think about treatments that might emerge from that. Um, what about if we think about it the other way? So what if we think about it um, from the pseudo-specific angle? So there, is a, there are a couple of examples um, of treatments that are um, being studied right now that are really based on uh, the understood circuitry related to particular behaviors. And sometimes it isn't even an understood circuitry. It's an understood neurochemistry um, emerging from uh, data um, that uh, sometimes is, is discovered by happenstance. Um, and sometimes, uh, to be honest, we don't really understand anything 
Um, but we just find that there's something that randomly helps a child, and that ends up being something that's useful for a larger population. It's important in all humility to acknowledge that in psychiatry, which is what I trained in, um, almost all of the treatments that we have currently were based on a complete black box. They were things that were observed to lead to benefit without any clue of why. Um, and then much of the next you know, couple decades is focused on why this thing that helps, helps, um, and how we might find something based on that knowledge that helps better. Um, so I think it's, it's important to be humble here. Um, but again, this is a pathway that has led to some success in ASD, and that's true on the medicine side. You'd say it's also true on the behavioral side. Understanding the fundamentals of learning um, and under understanding the fundamentals of behavioral analysis are really what led to our impactful treatments that we want to see applied to most children. Is that understanding specific to autism spectrum disorder? Not really, at least not to the causes of ASD, but it's really impactful. So one of the current examples, um, and the one that's maybe easiest to talk about, is oxytocin. Um, so this emerged not from the study of autism spectrum disorder, but from uh, studies focused initially on social ethology, looking at social function um, in animals. Um, most of us think about oxytocin in relation to sex, in relation to childbirth, in relation to lactation, um, but there's also a lot of literature that's emerged from the, um, the work of Sue Carter, Tom Insull, Larry Young, and many others looking at this in relation to pair bonding behavior in rodents. Um, Karen Bales, I haven't seen here. But um, in any case, this is, this is work that's been done by lots and lots of people. It clearly impacts social behavior in rodents. It impacts social behavior in primates. And there's emerging work showing that it, it clearly impacts social behavior in humans who do not have any uh, given disorder. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the data in autism. Um, I should also highlight there is some work pointing to vasopressin um, as another potential target. Um, you could think of it as a sister or maybe a brother hormone. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, although I think it's interesting, and there's a large study underway um, from Roche exploring that hypothesis. But would you say this is specific to autism? So there are really inconsistent plasma oxytocin findings in autism. It, it may be that there's a real signal there, but it's not something that's very clear. And then there's really unclear genetic data um, looking at the oxytocin receptor, sometimes the gene itself, sometimes uh, downstream uh, uh, regulation. Um, there are some studies that point to abnormal methylation of the oxytocin receptor, but nothing that you would say is clearly tying oxytoc oxytocin to autism risk. But it seems to move social behavior in anyone if you squirt it up their nose, but in fairly prescribed ways. So this is one of the, I would say, more hopeful studies about the behavioral impact of, of oxytocin squirted up somebody's nose. Um, uh, and it's in a, a behavioral paradigm uh, called the cyberball task, where um, this individual here, who's the study participant, uh, thinks they're playing catch with real people e on a computer. They either throw the uh, cyberball here to an individual who always throws it back, here to somebody who throws it willy-nilly, and here to somebody who never throws it back. Um, if you do this in typical participants, what you find is that they like to play catch with the person who plays nicely. If you do this in uh, high-functioning uh, young adults with autism spectrum disorder, what you find is that they don't much care where they're throwing the ball. We don't know why, right? We can't make that assumption, but they don't much care. If you squirt oxytocin uh, up their nose, um, and I should say these had, had a, a saline nasal spray administered up their nose, um, if you squirt oxytocin up their nose, now they prefer to play catch with a person who plays nicely. This isn't a treatment for autism. This is a one-time administration. It's a blinded study, but it says that you can actually move asocial behavior in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. This, interestingly enough, is a study that got a lot of press just in this past year from um, Kevin Pelfrey at Yale and colleagues. Um, and they, they actually wanted to see a move in social behavior in the study, and they didn't see a change in social behavior. They were looking um, to see if there was a, a difference in response to faces presented during an fMRI scan. But what they did see was that they, sh they saw a tendency to see more activation in areas of the brain related to reward and related to social processing in individuals who had had oxytocin squirted up their nose, including uh, striatum nucleus accumbens, um, in contrast to those who had saline squirted up their nose. Um, and that's something that's hopeful in thinking this is a brain-mediated effect. We don't yet know how that works exactly. I mean, it's going into the nose. How is it crawling up into the brain? Is it a feedback mechanism? We don't, 
we don't uh, say that we know exactly, although in other species it does look like there is penetration into the brain from intranasal uh, administration. So unfortunately, like secretin, there now has been a fairly widespread adoption of intranasal oxytocin in some segments of the ASD community. I don't know if this leads to benefit or leads to harm or what, but you can order, oxy and I, I want to be clear, I'm not advocating this, but you can order something that's called oxytocin um, on Amazon. Um, you can even get uh, sublingually, uh, to be administered um, uh, sublingual oxytocin on Amazon with the idea that this might potentially lead to benefit. Um, we, have, we have really no clue um, whether this is going to lead to benefit in the real world. Um, and you, know, you can imagine many ways that this actually could be a problem. So clearly we need larger sample sizes, and I'm part of a large study to look at this with the idea that we would love to see signal, but we need to know um, before we see tens of thousands of children exposed to this whether it does harm or does nothing, uh, nothing that we can measure. Um, and I would love to say that it's not gonna parallel secretin. I'd love that th for this to be something that really has a big impact. Um, there is more emerging data on acute dosing, including differences in response to faces, um, maybe differences in social cognition, but always single dose administration. Um, and the one study that has a sufficient sample size with chronic dosing really didn't see much of an effect um, to speak of, although still a fairly small sample size given the heterogeneity of autism. Um, you'd also ideally, if you have something that changes social behavior, like to pair it with something um, that leads to social learning. And that is being explored by a couple of groups. There's a group at Harvard um, that's trying to couple these things. There are others out there trying to do the same thing. And that might be really powerful, but we don't really have a good idea of how to do that either. Um, and then, of course, we want to have real-world outcome measures that are going to so show change. And we don't, frankly, know what those um, might be. So that's sort of where we are um, with regard to the current path with pseudo-specific treatments. Um, and I hope, and this is really forward-looking, this isn't something that's you know, right now, but I hope where we end up is a place where instead of looking at something that is truly pseudo-specific um, or something that's only 1% of the population, that we're able to identify treatments coming from one or the other angle or somewhere in between that, I, that are uh, able to benefit a subgroup of individuals um, that's more than 1%. Um, and I hope that that's based on biological markers or something that we can identify and measure. Uh, and I'm going to use an example of this that, again, isn't that hopeful, um, but I think interesting and maybe instructive. And this is an example of something that may be a treatment and forward-looking, um, that benefits more than the 1%, but less than the majority. And this is from a study that um, has been presented and not yet published, um, and all the sort of caveats that go along with that. Um, and this study was also funded by Seaside Therapeutics. I forgot the, the red mark on this one. Um, and they saw uh, no significant difference in social withdrawal in this study. Uh, not particularly a hint of a signal I'll show you in a moment, um, but they saw uh, right at the margins of statistical significance after correction for multiple comparisons, a difference in a, cl a clinical global impression measure that I'll show you in a moment. So this, to convince you that there really wasn't anything on the primary measure, this is the primary measure shown over the course of the study, and you really see uh, no significant difference between the groups, even when you're looking at the level of slope um, if you look at that clinical global impression measure, which is asking the physician who's seeing the child to say how severely affected is the child right now, um, what you see is uh, an improvement that separates the groups, maybe starting at eight weeks, but really emerging more at 12 weeks. Um, I think it's useful then to zoom in on that. It's a really nonspecific measure, um, but what is that signal um, since this is a, a crude measure of change? Um, the physicians, in addition to rating uh, clinical global impression of severity, how ill is the child right now, rate clinical global impression of improvement. So how much has the child improved since their initial enrollment in the study? Um, and what you see is that you see, uh, insofar as there is a signal on either of these, uh, it's a change uh, in children who don't uh, show any shift in, in severity over the course of the study, and a change in children who are rated a four, which means no change from baseline, um, where you see more kids on placebo in both categories. When you look just at those responders, what you see is a limited number of kids who show a really big shift in severity, a two-point shift in severity. So this is a kid who's going from uh, severely affected to moderately affected, which is 
a big shift. These are the sorts of things that we are always thrilled to see if we see it in the, in the context of a regular treatment clinic. But it's a small number. Um, and this is what's driving that statistically significant effect. But you're, you know, you're looking here at 11 kids. Um, you're not looking at a number that, um, that allows you to uh, hang your hat on something. We need to know who these kids are. Initially, you can imagine you could redo the study and find the same group of 11 kids out of 75 that show a significant improvement. But what you'd ideally like is you'd ideally like something that identifies that group that's going to benefit, not just in the studies, but clinically. Um, there is some hint, but uh, with lots and lots of comparisons done, that these may be the kids who come in with more language, um, whether that's because we can assess their social function differently or whether it's because they actually benefit more is hard to say. What we'd really like is a biological marker. Um, what would such a biomarker be? Well, we'd like it to be readily measurable. Um, ideally, it's something that isn't based on a fine-grained behavioral observation. If it's something we can measure on a brain scan, something that we can measure in the blood, that would, uh, it seems, be a bit stri more straightforward. We'd like it to be well replicated. Maybe we'd like it to be heritable, something that may indicate genetic risk. Um, maybe it would be something that would have a clear line. So autism spectrum disorder doesn't, right? We don't know where the edges are. But if we had a biomarker that did, that would be really useful. You'd like to see that it responds to treatment, but something may be a biological marker of a group and not change with treatment. And you'd like it to indicate something about what's happening in the brain. Um, you can imagine different biomarkers, and I've highlighted a, a number of these. Um, and there are many possible biomarkers. Uh, but the one I'm going to hone in on is, is sort of an oldie but a goodie, and it's the one that I uh, inherited from my mentors, presumably epigenetically. Um, and that's, um, the, that's elevated blood serotonin levels um, found in a subgroup of kids with autism. Again, here too, it depends a bit on where you draw the line. But in the uh, largest and most homogeneous population uh, in which it was assayed in Holland, they actually found what looks like a bimodal distribution, or at least the hint of one, where you see an elevation where, depending on the study, somewhere around 25% of kids with ASD have levels that are above the fifth percentile in the general population, or the 95th percentile, depending on how you're thinking about it. This was first identified by my great-grand mentor in 1961. So this has been around for a long time. Um, we know quite a lot about it, um, but there's a lot that we don't know about how it connects to pathophysiology. Interestingly, and just because I, I like showing this, um, uh, uh, it actually uh, correlates negatively with uh, serum oxytocin levels and the, or plasma oxytocin levels, and that may be telling us something. It may not be, um, but it's an interesting thing to explore further. Um, in the blood where this is measured, um, the serotonin is contained almost entirely in the platelet. Platelets aren't interesting to most people. I'm not going to dwell on them uh, extensively. They're interesting to me. Um, but it gets into the platelet via the serotonin transporter. The levels in the platelet and the levels in the blood are virtually identical. 99% um, of, of the, platelet or, uh, of the uh, serotonin or more is in the platelet. And it's extremely heritable. So heritability of 0.99, which is on the, the level of height um, in the general population. Um, it is associated with a variation in the serotonin transporter gene, but only in males. And there is a genetic linkage peak overlying the serotonin transporter gene in autism. We don't do much linkage. Actually, we don't do any linkage um, anymore. Uh, old school method. Um, but there's a linkage peak overlying the serotonin transporter gene, uh, again, only in families with affected males, but not affected females. No signal in families who have a girl who's affected in addition to a boy. Um, underlying that signal, uh, a number of rare variants in the serotonin transporter have been identified. Um, some of these variants are depicted here. They're in regions of the protein that are important for its function um, and important for its regulation. And when you put those rare variants uh, into cell models, um, and you can either transfect them or you can just take uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines from folks um, who actually have these uh, polymorphisms uh, natively, you see that each one of them leads to an increase in serotonin transporter function, which you might imagine would lead to an increase in serotonin uptake into the platelet in a very concrete way. The most common of these, the GLI-56 ALA variant, um, is a very subtle variant. So we're talking about a single methyl group differing um, at, a, at an amino acid. It is in a region of the protein that's important for regulation. It's over-transmitted to affected males, but not affected females. Um, and it is um, the one of these variants that can be identified with regard to uh, behavioral traits. It shows an association with rigid compulsive symptoms and with sensory aversion. 
Um, I should note that this is conserved uh, in the mammal serotonin transporter, but it's not necessarily conserved um, back towards uh, chickens, lizards, et cetera. Um, so it is something that is not likely to profoundly disrupt function, um, but likely to alter function. It is found in some folks who are in repositories, genetic repositories of people who are unaffected. Um, we can't go back and ascertain them, um, but it's about 1% or half of 1% in the general population, about 2% in the population with ASD that's been looked at. Um, what it really does is it enables us to translate something into mice um, that is a concrete variant as opposed to changing expression levels. And so that's what we uh, did now uh, several years ago for developing the initial um, line of mice. These mice grow normally, they appear to reproduce normally, and importantly, they recapitulate the biomarkers. So they may give us an idea of what's happening in some people, at least, who have this uh, biological marker. So in the platelet, the serotonin transporter takes up serotonin um, and leads to elevated blood serotonin levels. Um, in the brain, it takes up serotonin uh, into the presynaptic cell and would be expected to lead to a decrease in synaptic serotonin levels. Um, and so that's what we would expect to be looking at uh, in the mouse. And if we look uh, in the brain, um, we actually see uh, just that. If you, uh, and this is work done in collaboration with Lynn Dawes, if you dump serotonin uh, into the extracellular space in the brain, um, what you see is an increased rate of serotonin clearance depicted here, measured by chronoamperometry. Um, this is actually a bigger increase than what's seen in cell models. Um, then, of course, even though we don't make the mouse in order to understand what autism might look like in a mouse, you would like some behavioral readouts. And we did a lot of behavioral assessment. I'll show you a couple pieces of it. We did see decreased ultrasonic vocalizations at postnatal day seven when the pups are separated from the dam. Um, and we also saw differences in the tube test, you might call it a, a McDonald's Playland assay. Um, where uh, mouse is introduced into either side of the tube after they've been trained uh, to go through the tube to return to their home cage. And you see that the wild type mice uh, tend to go out forward, the mutant animals tend to back out. Um, that isn't something we do in the course of autism assessment, um, but frankly, none of the behavioral tasks that we do in mice are things that we do in the course of autism assessment. So we then would like to understand not just what's happening at the level of this one protein, but how this affects uh, broader brain function, and I'll show you just a little bit of that. Um, this is uh, sensitivity to an agonist drug, a stimulating drug at the serotonin 1A receptor. Um, in response to that drug, you see a readout that is a drop in body temperature based on output from the RAF-A to the hypothalamus. Um, that drop in body temperature is more dramatic in the mutant animals, suggesting that they are more uh, sensitive to stimulation of that receptor. If you think about the model, you might have more clearance leading to less tonic exposure to serotonin levels, leading to upregulation in response at that receptor. Um, at the level of the synapse, uh, we really weren't sure what the readout would be because you have this balancing, uh, trying to reestablish homeostasis. And this is work from Hideki Iwamoto, um, showing that actually uh, when driven by phenylephrine, uh, you see a decrease in basal firing rate, which suggests actually that the autoreceptors may may overcompensate um, to the decrease in uh, extra uh, cellular serotonin. So biomarker tells you something about what's going on in the brain, still not certainly at the level of uh, circuitry, at least not in a sophisticated way. And then that raises the question of where you might intervene. And I don't have an answer yet, um, but there are lots of places that you might intervene, and we're exploring any number of these. Um, but then I think importantly, you not only have the question of do you want to intervene on this side of the synapse or this side of the synapse, um, but you also have the question of when to intervene um, and what matters and what you might be able to move in terms of behavioral phenotype or brain phenotype at a given point in development. And this actually shows early expression of the serotonin transporter um, at embryonic day 13. And it's not just expressed in the REF-A, um, it actually during development is expressed transiently in a number of areas important for sensory development. And so we're really interested in understanding because this allele is associated with sensory aversion in children with autism spectrum disorder, whether this actually is realized in the context of development of sensory systems. Um, I, this is extremely forward-looking and, and mostly unknown, but w where you might imagine being able to translate this would be using particular medications that may target the serotonin system. And this is one where there's a little bit of data looking at uh, social response, old data, um, but looking at a drug um, that's actually the same drug we used to stimulate the serotonin 1A receptor to show the body temperature change uh, in rats, showing that uh, after administration of a lower dose of this drug, you see an increase in social uh, interaction. 
interaction. Um, this is done in a very different way than we might do today, um, but there actually is a large study of buspirone that hasn't been published yet um, that is a quite dirty drug, but it does also act as a serotonin-1A agonist. So maybe there is some potential translation there. Um, ultimately, though, we don't just want to administer a drug. We don't just want to sprinkle something on the synapses and then magically everything gets better. We want to administer something that might put the brain in a state that's better able to benefit um, from teaching, from uh, behavioral uh, treatments. There are very few examples of this in ASD. This is the one um, that has sufficient size to be able to really talk about. And it was administration of behavioral treatment um, on top of risperidone treatment. So every kid got risperidone um, for problem behavior of one sort or another, but the same sort of irritability, agitation, disruptive behaviors um, that risperidone is usually used for. Um, half of the children got an additional uh, family-delivered behavioral intervention. Um, those children did do better. You see this separation uh, over time, but unfortunately when these children were followed up at six months, there was no longer any particular separation between the groups, suggesting that the benefit attenuates. And this is one of the challenges of putting things together. Risperidone has a really big effect, right? Um, when you add behavioral treatment to that, you may not be able to detect the differences. So now they're going back and looking at if you administer this behavioral treatment to a child who doesn't need risperidone, do you see benefit in the same way? And maybe they can find common doses or uh, a dosage where you see a, an intersection in effect. What they did find is that they ended up with a lower dose of risperidone in the group that was uh, receiving the behavioral intervention, which could be very useful for families that are seeing a lot of side effects with the medicine. What we would hope instead of this quite modest treatment effect, I should say that this is sort of a mixed story as well. It's a better story in rats and mice um, than it is in humans at this point. Um, but using a drug that I'm not gonna have time to uh, discuss in detail, but a, d a drug that is a positive allosteric modulator at the NMDA receptor, people have been able to potentiate behavioral treatments based on extinction. Um, and this is in things like obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety disorder, fear of heights, um, where you use exposures to whatever is feared or dreaded in order to decrease the anxiety and see improvements in symptoms over time. What is found in any number of these studies, and this one is in OCD from uh, Sabina Wilhelm, um, is a decrease uh, in the time that it takes to see improvement if you add the drug right before the behavioral treatment is administered. So this is given one hour before behavioral treatment, not again until a week later, one hour before the next behavioral treatment, which would just be incredible if we could do something like that in the context, context of ASD. Maybe a burst of something that would improve learning, and then you back off and you give a burst again. So this is my overview, and I realize I'm right at time. Um, so everything that we have right now is pseudo-specific, and that's not such a bad thing. Um, I think that we are going to find things that are targeted. I hope that some of those targeted things then benefit a larger population that has something common, but I can't tell you that that's necessarily going to be the case. It's just a hope. Um, it's quite forward-looking at this, at this point. I think we will also see things come down from the top. We'll see other things that are pseudo-specific. I can't tell you what those are necessarily going to be either, um, but I would imagine that some things from both angles are going to apply to a subgroup that I hope that we're going to be able to identify using one biomarker or another. Um, at this point, there are many hopeful biomarkers. I can't tell you which one it's going to be necessarily either. And that ultimately, where we will ideally end up is not um, something that we sprinkle on synapses that magically makes everything better, um, but we'll end up hopefully at a place that changes trajectories in response probably to multimodal treatments. Um, and I think that that would be just a wonderful thing to see. It's what we try to do right now, but without a lot of evidence. So any number of people uh, need to be acknowledged on the, on the clinical side. Lots of folks uh, you know, presenting the Fragile X trials in front of Rondi is sort of a funny thing. So uh, Rondi and Lisberry Kravis were sort of the intellectual leaders of that whole enterprise. And then a lot of folks both in and out of industry um, contributed. Um, and then folks that uh, worked directly with uh, my group at Vanderbilt. And then a lot of folks on the molecular side that I uh, went through quite quickly. So I will stop there and take questions. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm really interested about the synapse versus the postsynaptic with serotonin. The SSRIs have seemed kind of vague to me, and, and when I look at the mechanism, and now Brintelix is one that's working postsynaptic. 
And I have several teenagers who I've gotten off of the Abilify and onto the Brintelix so they can lose weight. And it really does seem to work on the anxiety and agitation. But again, you know, I've got shrinks telling me that the irritability is about bipolar. Those and darn I'm, shrinks. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I can say that. You can say it too. It's fine. <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, <clears throat> if they don't have experience with autistic children, they see the irritability as you know hypomania or something. And so, I'm definitely doing anecdotal out here on the front line. Yeah, and I, so you know, I I see kids with autism spectrum disorder in my clinic, and um, I, would, I would say that I, I don't bind myself exclusively to the evidence, and I acknowledge that a lot of what we do is pseudo-specific, but where I see a child with autism spectrum disorder who has depression, I don't say, well, we don't have it, any evidence for how to treat this. I think about what benefits depression in the general population, and we do that, starting with behavioral activation, but also reaching to antidepressants. When we don't find something that works. And I would say, you know, you do the same thing um, in any setting. We don't have good evidence for how to treat anxiety in children with autism spectrum disorder who are not in that high functioning group that benefits from cognitive behavioral therapy. And it is, it's a quite rarefied group. It's elegantly done where it really emphasizes the behavioral component. Yeah. Um, but lots of kids with autism spectrum disorder are, are very anxious, and some of them are quite impaired by that. Um, and some of those will benefit from the same things that would benefit anxiety in, in you or I or anyone else. It's a pseudo-specific treatment. We don't have great evidence. But it's not an unreasonable thing to try, and it will probably improve outcomes in some individuals. It will also make things worse in some individuals. Yeah. And that's where I sort of flashed up the, the serotonin reuptake inhibitor um, evidence quite briefly. There's a large study done by Brian King and colleagues, adequately powered, you know, nicely designed as a randomized controlled study, but taking all comers with significant repetitive behavior, regardless of whether it was necessarily very impairing, regardless of what type of repetitive behavior, whether it was compulsive or not. Um, and they followed clinical global impression over time. So they looked for global improvements. They weren't narrowing down on one specific improvement. And then they looked at lots and lots of different things to see if they saw any movement. They didn't see any benefit that was clinically significant. They saw a tiny statistically significant benefit in irritability and agitation symptoms, um, which is the same subscale that's treated by all of the atypical antipsychotics that have been looked at adequately. So there are probably some kids where that may be driven by anxiety, compulsivity, we don't know who may benefit. When they looked back and looked at those kids where there was significant evidence of distress at the family level and impairment at the child level, they actually saw a differential response to uh, placebo treatment, where the children who didn't come into the trial with the sort of symptoms, honestly, that most of us would treat in the clinic with a medicine, did much better on placebo than they did on the drug. Um, and those kids, maybe were the kids who saw a lot of the side effects from the drug that you know, people sometimes will liken to mania. And it, it's pretty similar to drug-induced mania, where the kids are more impulsive, they're not sleeping, they're more hyperactive. These are things you don't want to cause with a medicine. Um, and then in the other group, it becomes too small where you can't adequately measure it. But there is some signal that suggests benefit. Somebody needs to go back, and Rodney and I talked about this this morning, but go back and understand um, in different age groups when you're targeting different symptoms and, frankly, targeting anxiety um, or targeting frank OCD if you see benefit. And in fact, in adult studies, where they actually recruit folks who are able to communicate that they are suffering from something that looks a lot like OCD, or obsessive compulsive disorder, you see significant benefit um, in a couple of studies that have used serotonin reuptake inhibitors. As I, it's hard to say. I, I will say in our animals, you see that they are more sensitive um, to administration of serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which you'd expect. If the receptors are used to seeing less serotonin, we're now preventing serotonin right. uptake. And that whole feedback yep. too. Yep. And what we, what we know less is what happens chronically, although we do see rescue of some behaviors with chronic treatment. Um, it looks pretty similar to the changes you see in the wild type animals with the same treatment. So it's a little hard to say that that's specific. Um, but it is something that might suggest that the kids that our mouse maybe models um, would be more likely to see initial side effects, would be more sensitive to those medicines. So I, I guess the short answer to the question is, you know, you do, you do what works um, based on adapted treatments from other areas, even without specific evidence, and then you 
do research to find something better. Yeah, right. So some of the signaling pathways and other mechanisms that have been implicated through risk genes for autism don't have obvious drug implications. They're not obvious targets. Yeah. So for example, if you were looking at an HDAC uh, gene like CHD8, yeah. is epigenetic kind of drug intervention too global to be clinically useful? Yeah, so you know, this is, this is an interesting thing. So if, if we look at our oldest examples of risk genes that relate to autism spectrum disorder, either fairly closely, like in Fragile X syndrome, um, or transiently, like in Rett syndrome, where oftentimes you see a period of language loss and social withdrawal impairment, and then the social symptoms and things that might look like ASD aren't as prominent when those girls get older. Um, in both cases, these are proteins that have very broad function. So for fMRP, this is something that Behind so many uh, mRNAs, it's really hard to even keep them all in, in one table. Um, so if you think about that, that's very different from something that you would intervene upon uh, with an mGlur5 uh, negative allosteric modulator. It, it boggles the mind that you would have something that targets a single receptor that might reflect the action of something that binds to so many proteins. Yet in the mouse, that's transformative. And in Rett syndrome, where MECP2 you know, acts in a similar way related to chromatin regulation and regulates gene expression, you can see that there are some hints, um, and actually some of those hints are translating into potential treatments related to BDNF, related to IGF-1, and actually there's some promising data that's been published in a press release, but not yet a paper, um, looking at an IGF-1 analog in Rett syndrome with a lot of promise. And then there's some um, data also from uh, Walter Kaufman's group, but in a smaller study, similarly showing promise with IGF-1. This is something that is you know, very far from the action of the protein, but is this downstream effect um, that may matter quite a lot. We could hope for the same thing with CHD8. It, it scares me a little bit to try to intervene at the level of chromatin regulation because there are so many effects that we don't understand at all. Um, and doing that in an animal, that's fine with me. Um, but then doing that in a human um, who still has a developmental trajectory, even though it may not be the same developmental trajectory we're all hoping for, makes me really, really nervous. So it may be that some of those approaches work, but I think that they're gonna be more targeted they're gonna to need to be more targeted than what we have available right now, which sometimes are agents that are you know, chemotherapies that we would be hesitant to apply um, in a child, um, at least a child who isn't gonna die of their condition. Um, and you know, there's gradations there. Maybe you think about something in a child who's more severely affected, um, but it does make me quite nervous. You mentioned that some children benefit from risperidone. In your experience, um, when children do benefit from risperidone, do they continue to benefit at the same dose year after year? Or what things happen over time? Do the side effects get worse over time? You know, if a child's been taking risperidone for five years versus six months, yeah. you know, is there much known about that? So there's, there's a lot known in the general population and some known in autism spectrum disorder specifically. The first thing I'd say is, um, you know, this talk isn't about you know, what you should do in terms of managing um, uh, difficult co-occurring symptoms in the context of autism spectrum disorder. Um, I reserve risperidone for situations where I'm worried about somebody getting hurt. Um, not, you know, not just like a pinch or something, but somebody having to go to the emergency room because they've been hurt um, in a significant way. And that extends not just to aggression or self-injury, but also very severe impulsivity um, the sort of darting behavior or elopement behavior that, that can lead to a child being hit by a car. And that's obviously a, a time you think about a medicine with those sorts of side effects. Um, and then the other context where I would reach for risperidone are situations where a child is gonna lose access to a setting where they're otherwise gonna benefit. So if a child can't remain in a classroom where you think they're better able to learn than in some more exclusionary setting, um, that's a situation you would think about a medicine like that, even if nobody's being hurt. Um, and then lastly, a child who um, isn't benefiting from everything else and does have a lot of difficulty with irritability, temper tantrums that are interfering with treatment, and you've really tried everything else that you can try, um, even if they're not gonna, gonna lose access to something. So with regard to response, so it's 
roughly 75% to 80% of kids with ASD who show a clinically meaningful response to risperidone. We don't know it quite as clearly. Um, that was from the initial study where you didn't see much placebo effect because people didn't think medicines helped um, individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Once people started to think that medicines helped, the placebo effect came up, or at least that's one explanation for it. Um, so uh, in those initial studies, you see that level of response. You see sustained response in most of those kids that initially respond at least out to six months. Um, but then past the, that, you don't really know from the research. I can say that I've seen any number of kids who do show sustained benefit over time, um, but you oftentimes see some slippage. That slippage often overlaps with growth or with puberty. These things can't be separated easily. When a child goes from being uh, managed physically quite frequently, so parents who are using some physical redirection or frankly sometimes having to use restraint, and now the child is too big to manage that way, um, oftentimes you see a worsening initially in aggressive behaviors um, because the child doesn't have the safety of um, being restrained as a way of com uh, controlling behavior, um, which can be very reassuring to a child. Um, not every child, but some children. And that's, that's oftentimes a time when you see a difference. And then when children grow, sometimes they do need a higher dose. There are a lot of potential side effects. So sedation is one of the ones that we see early. Um, you don't want to make a child less aggressive because they're sleeping. That's not the goal. Um, but some of the initial benefit oftentimes is that the child is slowed down. That tends to wear off over time, which is the good news. The bad news is that there are movement disorders associated with being administered these medicines, and these can be dystonic reactions, which can be painful and alarming, something like a, 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 a neck twist dystonic reaction, or um, people will actually have their eyes turn up, which is really alarming. Um, you can treat that with Benadryl usually quite quickly, but it's not something that you want to see. Um, and then over time, you have a risk of what's called tardive dyskinesia, and that is something that emerges um, usually with extended treatment, but um, emerges with these medicines in more children than we, would, than we would like to see. It isn't the majority. In the old versions of these same, this same approach, you saw it in the majority of individuals who are exposed for a decade. Um, we don't want to use these drugs for a decade. Um, we want to use these drugs for a brief period of time, ideally put in social supports, behavioral supports that work more effectively when the child actually is calmer, and then use those same things as we fade off the medicine. That oftentimes isn't possible. The other probably bigger problem from a medical perspective is that kids gain weight, and they continue to gain weight. Usually they don't, sometimes they do level off at a, at a new sort of weight class, but oftentimes they don't, and they just keep gaining weight, and then you end up with a child who's 16 years old and 300 pounds, which isn't anything that anyone wants. Um, and so I usually contract for weight when we start one of these medicines, that we agree on a weight where we absolutely will stop the medicine. Um, and there are other approaches to try to manage weight, but it's really difficult. Um, and oftentimes these are, these are kids for whom food has been one of the main reinforcers over time, and now you're making them much hungrier um, with the medicine, and it's really hard to unhook those things. Um, so it's, it isn't something that we wanna do, um, but for some kids, it's something that really helps them a whole lot and allows them to have surges in development that wouldn't happen if they were irritable, agitated, aggressive. Um, all of the time because of their internal experience, not because they're bad kids, um, but these are medicines that can be really calming. And they would do the same thing for any of us. You know, if we're inclined, at least as, as far as I would imagine it, if we're inclined to hit people, um, you, you put one of somebody who doesn't have an autism spectrum disorder on an atypical antipsychotic, they're probably gonna be less inclined to hit people, at least impulsively or reactively. I just wanted to pick your brain a little bit about your thoughts about um, antioxidants and cannabinoids. Um, one, I remember a study that Hardin did about NAC. Yeah, and acetylcysteine. And, yeah. and whether you routinely use antioxidants, and what are your thoughts about some future cannabinoids, not THC, but you know yeah. some of the CBD, U, and V, and some of these other things that are coming out? Yeah. So I. I think both, both of these things are things that you would imagine would be in that pseudo-specific category, at least initially. Um, there is data pointing to uh, increased oxidative stress in some children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, 
there isn't as much data pointing to that necessarily happening in the brain. In theory, one of the potential actions of N-acetylcysteine is to uh, bypass uh, cysteine uptake and end up leading to increased in glutathione. Um, in theory, that might be a very good thing, um, but we really don't have anything beyond the theory to say that that's um, even the way that it's acting, since it also uh, has impact on the glutamate system. So. Um, that initial study, um, like a lot of smaller initial studies done at a single site, doesn't have a big placebo response rate and shows sort of pan improvements, improvements in a lot of different measures. Um, there are also some negative studies that have been done um, but aren't published, um, and that, I, I think, leads to some pause. There is a, a very encouraging study of N-acetylcysteine and trichotillomania, um, which you could imagine compulsive hair pulling, you, you could imagine that that would have some similarities to some of the repetitive behaviors in autism spectrum disorder. And then there's unfortunately a negative follow-up study there too. Um, so I'd say that there's mixed evidence. I, I have reached to N-acetylcysteine any number of times because it shouldn't do harm. <laughs> Um, and I have had some kids who do show benefit. I, I don't know why. I had one girl who, has, who had really severe um, compulsive self-injurious behavior um, who improved uh, on N-acetylcysteine in a really dramatic way and got worse again when it stopped. And that's one of the things I do to ascertain if it's a real response. We'll go on. If it helps, we'll go back off. We'll go back on if things get worse again off. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know why that happened exactly, but I sure wasn't going to stop it again. Um, this is somebody who had scarring um, from self-injury. So um, that's something I've reached to. I haven't uh, encouraged people to use uh, medical marijuana. Um, I haven't prescribed Marinol. Um, but, you know, I think that in situations where nothing is working and you have a lot of severity, I, I don't blame people for reaching for things. I would say that if you're going to do something like that, you should do it in the same way that you should initially do a small case series where you go on, off, on. Um, if you do see benefit, um, then it should be actually studied in a randomized controlled trial to see if it is a specific benefit. Um, one challenge with cannabinoids, um, or with THC specifically, is that uh, you see short-term changes and then you see, see long-term changes. And as somebody who trained as a psychiatrist, um, yeah, you know, smoking weed definitely can make you less anxious. Um, but if you're doing it as, a, as an adolescent, it also can end up leading to risk of psychosis. And there's really robust data to show that. And it also can lead to um, either an avolitional syndrome, and we're all sort of familiar with this dude, um, but it also can lead to memory problems and can end up leading to depression in a, a subset of individuals. And I, you know, I had a young man I treated during training who was floridly psychotic any time he was smoking weed. But if he wasn't smoking weed, he was really anxious. Um, so from his perspective, it made him feel a lot better to, to smoke. <laughs> But it isn't something I would ever ad advocate as a treatment. And that's one of the concerning things, that there's a place where you could do harm. Um, I think that there are really interesting emerging data on the role of endocannabinoids. Um, and we don't necessarily know how to target these things in a very specific way yet. Um, but endocannabinoids clearly have important roles at glutamatergic synapses. They can provide feedback. There's data in the uh, CPAP3 mouse model of uh, really severe compulsive behavior that looks sort of OCD-like um, that suggests that endocannabinoids would be a potential path toward treatment. But that's a lot different than smoking what's currently available um, at your local dispensary, as I understand. Yeah, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't put THC out of the uh, yeah. out of the way. But uh, but um, also, you don't routinely use any mitochondrial antioxidant cocktail or anything. I don't. I, you know, there are. So if a kid has a mitochondrial disorder, that's a different story. Right? But for idiopathic autism, where you don't know that there's something going on um, metabolically, I, that isn't something that I, that I do or recommend. Um, I, you know, I do do things that are, are not evidence-based that you know, I, I think we all sometimes reach for, things with a little evidence base, like omega-3 fatty acids, where it may lead to health benefits. There's a little bit of data suggesting that it, it has a modest effect size in ADHD. Um, and there's a little bit of data suggesting that it may benefit some kids with ASD. Small, smallish effect size, mixed data. 
I don't know if it actually helps. Um, but for a child who's sort of you know, on the border of whether you think about a medicine or not, it's a reasonable enough place to start. Do no harm is one of the, the nicest ways to get started. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.